We are privileged now to have with us Francesco Spagnolo, who has worked at the University of California, Berkeley since 2010 as the founding curator of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life and as associate adjunct professor in the Department of Music and the Center for Jewish Studies. He is also a scholar in residence with the Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra in San Francisco. Prior to moving to the United States, Francesco worked as an anchor for the cultural programs of Italian National Radio in Rome. And he just told me that when he was young, he met the renowned professor Israel Adler, the great musicologist who inspired him to do his work. So welcome, Francesco. Thank you, Josh. It's so good to be here with you. So we're investigating the life and work of Salomone Rossi Hebreo. And no one knows more about Jewish music in Italy than you. Help us put Rossi's achievement in context. Tell us about Jewish music in Italy in the various communities. So the way I've been contextualizing Salomone Rossi has been by trying to reconstruct the dynamics of synagogue life in uh, Italy. And um, so how to do that? First of all, what are the sources for that? Music is one of them, of course, it's part of the central one, but uh, liturgical texts and are also important Commun communal records uh, that tell us who was cantor, where, when, and uh, allow us, th these are records that often allow us to reconstruct uh, the genealogy of cantorial families and rabbinic families. And in Italy, we actually, when we when we think about music in the synagogue, we have to think about both kind of like what happened with, with Salomone Rossi and, and Leone Modena, even Leone Modena himself, about both rabbis and cantors. Um, rabbis have a very, very active and traditionally and historically have had a very, very active role in um, sort of um, setting up the, the, the context for, for music in the, in, the, in the Italian synagogues. So that's that's one type of contextualization. The other is more broadly cultural. Um, Italy is a very interesting site for for the study well of Jewish music. The most ancient, among the most ancient uh, notated sources of of Jewish music period are from Italy. So when we think about Jewish music, Italy is one of the places we think about, and yet also a very diverse place because what happened in Italy is not only that there was a historic migration from ancient Palestine to partially to Rome, but especially to southern Italy. But then there were many internal and other global migrations. So with the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, um, we have to think that the uh, Jews of southern Italy were also under Spanish rule. So they were expelled as well. So the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in, uh, in, uh, in Italian terms is also an important factor. Where did these Jews go? Some of them just sprinkled like all the other Iberian Jews sprinkled themselves around the Mediterranean, North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond. And, um, but others moved northbound. So we have this movement of the heirs to the ancient Jewish communities of Southern Italy moving northbound. A classic example of that is the last name Pugliese, which means Apulian from the, from the region of the, the that's the, the the heel of the boot region from this area. And it's a, it's a Jewish last name from Northern Italy. And that's, that's just one example of how we can track this. We can track this linguistically. Uh, my, my, my good friend, an incredible scholar of, of Judeo-Italian languages, George Dropnowitz, um, has kind of over the years mapped out the idea that there is, there is a spreading of Southern Italian linguistic elements into the North that is possibly a consequence of this internal migration. So that's an important aspect. When we think today of Italy, we think of a country called Italy. But of yeah. course, the period we're talking about, the Italian peninsula, mm -hmm. was yeah. divided into many different, I don't know if we would call them countries or duchies or, or All lands. All sorts of countries. Yeah, which had their own uh, culture, absolutely. their own different languages, actually, mm -hmm. and competing with each other, at war with each other sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so 
by the time Jews started moving northbound was also the time that the ghettos were formed, beginning with the ghetto in Venice. But the, the ghetto in Venice was a place named ghetto, and then it soon became an idea. Mm -hmm. And and it's a it's a very interesting, albeit haunting, idea, because it what ghettos did is that they established some sort of permanent, although expulsions were of course possible, some, some semi-permanent Jewish enclave within the urban textures of Italian cities, which were, as you were saying, since there were all these different states, many of these were capitals. So they were not just Italian towns. Today, they're sometimes small towns, but at the time they were capitals of entire kingdoms. And so they had their own foreign policy and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, commercial trade and, and 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 whatnot. So each of these places was 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 uh, was, was a, a central of ideas. So with that, the sprinkling of Jews from southern Italy into the north, and then the formation of ghettos and kind of this global migration of Ashkenazi Jews, Sephardic Jews, southern French Jews, northern French Jews, um, Mediterranean Jews, North Africa from from Turkey. And so on, that all arrived to these Italian cities, especially the ghetto of Venice, but very much beyond Mantua, Ferrara, and, and so on, brought and they, a, and they a very to... multicultural texture to, to this, uh, to this uh, kind of landscape. And they tended to keep within their own communities. There, there wasn't a lot of uh, integration of the communities. Each of these diaspora communities tended to keep to itself. Well, yes and no. And the yes and no is also due precisely to the establishment of ghettos. They were all confined within the mm -hmm. same area. So they had to negotiate one another. Uh, there is a, I think it's an 18th century, in the 18th century, uh, some architects did studies of the, of the buildings in the Venice ghetto. And you know that the area was small so that the buildings kept growing in height. The skyscrapers. And, and yeah. we have this incredible drawing and it has actually for each apartment unit, has last names of who inhabited. And in some ways, it's not different from an apartment building in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem today, where you will have, you know, Ashkenazim and Yemenites on, you know, and the same floor and above you will have Polish and, and Moroccan and, and so on and whatnot and Greek, et cetera, et cetera. You really find this like multicultural texture inside the ghetto itself. So they couldn't really keep to themselves. They kept- um, They had their own synagogues, They course. kept liturgical, texts, but they blended mm. and uh, they intermarried and also other things happened. Like think about the, the, the cultural history of the core synagogues in the Venice ghetto. The first one to be established is the so-called Scola Tedesca, mm -hmm. which means German. Mm -hmm. So most people, when they hear German in this context, they think it's the synagogue of the German Jews except German in Venice before the establishment of the ghetto, so Tedesco, was a code word for Jews who resided illegally in the city when they were supposed to live on the mainland. Ah. So basically, Tedesco meant Jews in Venice. And when we, when we listen to their, to their melodies today, we see that there is a syncretism between Ashkenazi and Italian melodies in that, in that tradition. So let me interrupt for a second. When uh, Benedetto Marcello goes into the synagogue in Venice circa 1724 or so, and he notates the different melodies, some of them are notated Tedesco. I've assumed yes. that that meant the Ashkenazi melodies because he also notates some of them as Sephardi. But um, with this sort of cultural history, that's what I was saying, I've been trying to establish context, both in terms of the dynamics of synagogue life and cultural dynamics into ghettos and communities. And so when we, when we think about it this way, we understand that that was actually the synagogue of the earliest arrivals, the more permanent Jews in this very moving and changing landscape. Venice was, you know, the capital of, of the world almost at that time. You know, it was like the Paris of the 19th century, the New York, the 20th. That's what it was Venice was. Everybody wanted to be there. And so having a ghetto was actually an achievement in some ways, because before that, Jews had to live on the mainland, this called terra ferma, and they had to ferry themselves in, pay for the transportation and pay for stay up to three days at the most, and then and then go back. So this, in, in some ways, this was an achievement of some kind of status. They had to pay for it, but they achieved the status. So 
when 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 I listen to these melodies, I, I actually recognize the variety of elements that are not just Ashkenazi, even though they're branded as Tedesco. So we have to rethink our categories. And um, the same thing can be said of the Italian synagogue. The Italian synagogue in the Venice ghetto was actually established by the under the impetus of the arrivals of, of the Kabbalistic scholars who were sent by, they were disciples of Moshe Cordovero in the, you know, in the 15, mid 1500s were, were sent as emissaries to Europe and went to Venice for the same reasons we're listing before. And so it's true that they adopted the Italian prayer book, but they also started, they republished it. There were printing presses that printed Hebrew mm -hmm. and they republished it and they started inserting Kabbalistic language there. So they started changing it and making it also their own. So again, the, the Italian synagogue where, where Leone Modena was the cantor, it was probably the only job he really held in his life, right? We know that the guy was, you know, he had some trouble holding on to, to a profession. He had many um, and his gambling habits and all of that. But, uh, but that synagogue was called Italian, but that didn't mean that was the only place where Italian Jews went to. Hmm. So we find this syncretism, we find these, these, uh, these, um, these changes, but we also find communities where small groups remained relatively isolated and maintained their own uh, traditions. So, uh, for example, some communities in, in, in northern Italy, in Piedmont, a, a classic example of this are the, the so-called, it's an acronym, Aleph Pe Mem, tran transliterated into Roman script as APAM, A-P-A-M. It's the, the, these are three towns, one is actually a city maybe, in Piedmont, today in Piedmont, it was back then Savoy, but um, actually back then was something else, and I'll get to it in a second, but it was Asti, Fossano, and Moncalvo. So in these three locations, French Jews who were the heirs to a Western Ashkenazi uh, musical and liturgical tradition settled in the 1300s and maintained their traditions only for the high holidays uh, until the community lasted and you know the, the last remains were recorded in the 1950s but probably before world war ii they already were vanished at the time they settled these three towns were at the border of three different states so that's an example of the interconnectedness so heirs to one community arrived from from france settle in, in northern Italy, and they settle into three countries and they're able to essentially, by living just a few miles on the road from each other, do international trade hmm. and maintain a collective tradition of culture and music. And then each community kind of drifted in different ways. So when, when we look at, at, at their music and, and the written music that they left behind, we see how some, some, like some of these communities then veer towards Ashkenazi or stayed in the Ashkenazi sphere of Italy, and others went more towards the Italian sphere of Italy. So ju let, let's just do a little recount of things. We have Southern Italian Jews, which are essentially, and, and Roman Jews, which are essentially what we refer to as the Italian Italian Jews in Italy. The earliest arrivals from Palestine, the earliest set settlement of Jews in, in history. So we're going back a couple thousand years. Sephardic Jews that arrive from, from both, um, um, both um, uh, Iberia, but also through North Africa and, and, the, and the Eastern Mediterranean and the Balkans. We have Southern Ashkenazi Jews who arrived from today's Austria, Southern Germany, and they, they settled across they the Alps and they settled in Northern Italy. We have Provencal Jews that mostly moved to either the coast towns, so Genoa, or eventually Livorno, um, but uh, but mostly also in the in the north uh, in the northwest of the of the peninsula. And we also have these northern French Jews, which are actually Western Ashkenazi Jews, but from France, who also settle in northern Italy. So th these are all different denominations that come. And sometimes mingle, sometimes they preserve their own uh, both uh, inflections and pronunciations, or they modify their pronunciations accordingly, their liturgical texts, and also pool of core melodies. In all of this, what that means is that musically, the landscape of Italy, Jewish landscape of Italy, includes various types of repertoires. What I re usually refer to as core repertoires are the ones that are really specific to one location. Let's say you go to Ferrara, where there, there, were, there was one building with three synagogues, Italian, Sephardic, Ashkenazi, 
on three floors, except in the winter when everybody became Sephardic because heating was only in the Sephardic synagogue. So everyone went to the, the heated synagogue. Um, but you, you could identify specific elements of each tradition on each floor of that building. And um, so that's what I would call core. And then we have shared or pan-Italian elements. So for example, for a long time, Venice was, was, had the lion's share and then eventually Livorno. By the 19th century, Livornese melodies went all over, including Venice. So today's Venice sounds a lot like Livorno, that the, the Portuguese connection went through, etc. cetera. Um, and then we also have very interesting elements. And that is a way to also think about the production of Salomon Rossi or what ethnomusicologists would call or ethnographers would call, would call um, uh, co-territorial repertoires. So these are repertoires that are shared between different groups. So in this case, Jews and non-Jews within the same territory. Mm -hmm. um, a case in point that, you know, is, is the, there, there is a Judeo Piemontese Gadia, where the, the, the Gadia, the Gadi, the, 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 the kid of the, of the Passover song is a cavra, and it's a, yeah, it's a cavra, capretto, and, uh, and in Piemontese it's crava. So what I found in my research is that that actually is a Piemontese song that was adapted by Jews to the narrative of Had Gadia. And, and the music is shared and borrowed from, from non-Jewish surroundings and brought into the Jewish home for the Passover Seder. We find the same thing in the synagogue. And in some ways, we find that also with what has been called the introduction of art music in the synagogue, which is from, from a, let's say, a, an anthropological and ethnographic standpoint, is really an example of co-territorial musical repertoire. Mm -hmm. This is a music style that is shared by Jews and non-Jews. And I would even argue, or at least put the question mark there, where it's not just shared outside of the synagogue, but also shared sometimes within the synagogue itself. In my reconstruction of synagogue life, one of the things that emerged very clearly is that the synagogues, including the synagogues of the ghettos, so the most secluded synagogues in, 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 in Italy, were often frequented by non-Jews. Non-Jews when a classic case was Purim. And of course, Purim uh, in Venice being mixed with carnival and people masked, etc., makes it easier for people not to be told apart. But still, getting into a ghetto at night, because most of, the, most of these rituals happen at night, involves a certain level of determination and, uh, and on the part of a non-Jewish synagogue. And risk. Right? Often having to bribe the guards that are guarding the gates and not letting people in or out. And we also know that in, because we find laws, you know, one of the beautiful things about laws is that they say no to things that people do in real life, right? Mm -hmm. So we find laws about prohibiting Jews from going to the opera. So we know that Jews went to the opera this way. Also a nocturnal activity. Mm -hmm. And when it maybe it's easier to go through the streets of a, of a town or city and, and, and be less visible, less detectable, etc. cetera. Um, so I want to encourage those of us who are listening to Italian Jewish music as a whole, but also especially to what we've been calling art music in the Italian synagogue, to listen it to what today we would call like a multicultural or even interfaith kind of the years of an interfaith or multicultural audience that included both Jews and non-Jews in the synagogue itself, because this is something that was going on. And this for me is very both, you know, interesting and fascinating from a historical standpoint, but also changes a little bit the emotional component of what we're researching and studying and discussing and listening to and enjoying listening to. Um, it makes me think that, uh, as we know from the work of incredible historians, the ghettos were also, they were not just places of surveillance and, and reclusion, but they also were places where intercultural exchanges could happen. So earlier you mentioned Benedetto Marcello. Benedetto Marcello transcribed or published transcriptions of 11 synagogue melodies with texts in Hebrew. He managed to write both the music and the text from right to left. Right to so he changed the direction of the music. He used a very, for the time, a very antiquated system of notation, graphic system of notation. So he clearly was trying to 
portray also on the with the typesetting of the page something that he thought was ancient. Mm -hmm. And and then the question is, and it could be that Marcello himself went into the ghetto because we know it's possible, or somebody else went into the ghetto, but definitely somebody who knew how to write music and who did the work that some of us who also work in Latin music college do. So they did, did field work. So whomever did this, I assume it was a man because just because of issues of majority and minority there, but um, who knows, of course. But whomever, and if maybe Marcello himself transcribed, transcribed these things, it meant that they had to sit with their informants and have them repeat things multiple times. So it means there is a physical proximity that's important. The same physical proximity we can also reimagine when we look at the pages of Salomon Rossi's Shirin, his Hebrew uh, compilation. Because that volume, which was published, we're getting there 400 years ago, pretty much. Um, that volume was printed at the Bragadina Press in Venice, which was a press that was mostly known for its uh, Hebrew printing, but it had musical types, had musical notes that were printed as well. And Bragadina did not have music. Venice did. There were many a very important essential music printers in Venice, but Bragadina was, as far as I know, there is no other musical work in its catalog. And so what that makes me think is that they may have borrowed some music typesetters from another printing press to make this, or some something must have gone on, something must have happened that brought people with different types of knowledge, Hebrew and musical typesetting together to make that work publishable and happen so that we have it today. And in the same group of melodies, there is also a Bezzetti Israel, which to me sounds like a central Italian folks tune. And even more so, a, a central Italian folk tune for the period of Christmas. And of course, this is a this is a bit satisfied for that most likely. Um, and I imagine also was collected a lot in the same context as Mao Tzu, but most likely for the Hallel for, for, uh, for Hanukkah. So these sources continue to prompt us to think in all kinds of ways. My main suggestion is to think about them in the context of both the dynamics of synagogue life, uh, the fact that you know women had a certain presence in the synagogue starting at a certain point, and non-Jews had a constant presence, that the dynamics of synagogue like changed, children were there, children were not there, etc. And so on, rabbis had a role just to remind our audience, Kol uh, Nidre. Um, in the Italian synagogue is typically a rabbinic piece, not a cantorial piece. So rabbis have a direct impact. Rabbis were the most mobile. Cantors were typically local, but rabbis were often hired outside of the community. They, they moved around, so they brought different traditions. And if they had a say, they mixed things just that way. And then families, quote unquote, intermarried, right? Um, different within the group because the population was always very small. And uh, so families themselves are a representation of this mosaic of, of cultural encounters. And, and those are then reflected back into synagogue life. And also really think about the multicultural encounters that the ghettos engendered and that continue to be a source of wealth of ideas and creativity to this day. And it's incredible how something that was done to control, to surveil, and at times to really also oppress a minority turn out to be such a fruitful laboratory of ideas. Um, um, I think that actually a series of unforeseeable and of course unforeseen causes were unleashed by the establishment of ghettos in the Italian cities at a very, very specific and peculiar juncture in world history. I, I've read someplace, I don't know if this is true, that uh, even before the um, exile in uh, 70, that there were Jews who went to Italy, who were traders during the Maccabean period, for example, and that there was a sizable uh, Jewish population in Italy. Furthermore, that many of the Romans wanted to become monotheists, 
and mm -hmm. there was no Christianity at the time, and it was up to maybe 10% of, of Italy or of the Roman Empire became Jewish, not just from the ethnic Jews, but those who adopted the religion. Is there any truth to that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not an historian of, of that period, but what I know from those who are is that it's true. True. Also, Jews went from ancient Palestine, from Judea, went as political emissaries directly to Rome. Oh, mm -hmm. And but uh, there, there were Jewish catacombs in Rome. They're mm -hmm. finally being reopened and made accessible. Um, there are Jewish catacombs in Rome, but also in southern Italy. From what period were those days? Uh, well, so these are the early centuries Jewish presence in the Italian peninsula. And what these, what, what these Jews brought to that land, they're one of the most rooted minority in the Italian peninsula throughout its history. One of its most trans-regional, as I discussed in, in, in our conversation, trans-regional trans minorities. Italian minorities tend to be very rooted in one place. And, and Jewish Italian minorities know they're interconnected. So they have a, they developed a sense for the peninsula that was granted to them in a way by, by, by their status and by their status of, of, of moving diasporic minority. So the, the ghettos, most of the ghettos were opened by Napoleon in the early 19th century, with the exception of the ghetto yeah. in Rome, which I think mm -hmm. you said was 1870, 17, yes. it was opened up. Well, so, they, so cities where Napoleonic troops arrived, mm -hmm. saw their ghettos opened. But there was also a counter uh, uh, movement. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. at times when Neapolitanic rule was no longer in place, ghettos were reinstated, mm -hmm, which was mm -hmm. kind of brutal, especially mm -hmm. in the 19th century, because it was, a, you know, as I was saying, you know, in, in the early centuries, in probably the early decades even uh, of Italian ghettos, there was a sense that this was somehow an achievement. Mm -hmm. But as centuries went on, it's very clear. I mean, in reading what, what Jews, ghettoite Jews in the early 19th century, mid 19th century, right? They're really suffering from, like they, they feel it's deeply unjust what they are suffering. They're, what it, that their suffering is illegal, un, un, unconceivable by, human, by humans, mm -hmm. it needs to be remedied. And this is why also they join with their entire soul into the national movement of Italian reunification as a way to, to, to really pave the way for, for a more legitimate, more stable Jewish life in the country. And in some ways they succeeded. And you know, then in 1922, Benito Mussolini went to power and things changed. But that's another story. Maybe we're not gonna talk about that. Francesco, thank you so much. This is so fascinating. Great of you to, to, to share this information with us. Thank you, Josh. Take care.